Last week, um, the uh, online magazine Tablet had a symposium on uh, U.S. military aid to Israel and uh, asked me to contribute to it. And this was after um, two senior writers at Tablet, Leo Leibowitz and Jacob Siegel, had written a long article arguing for the end of U.S. military aid to Israel. And I had written an article uh, two weeks ago, my column in JNS also explained why uh, it would be a good idea. And and I think that the symposium was an important event um, because it gets the issue onto the agenda. And it's an issue that I've been speaking about a lot on this show and in my writing, of course, for many, many years. But the person that I think is most important uh, on uh, in this area of uh, U.S. military aid to Israel and how it's impacted Israel's relations with the United States, how it's, how it's impacted Israel's own strategic thinking, particularly among Israel's generals, is Dr. David Wormser, the head of security policy, uh, my longtime friend and colleague. So first of all, uh, that's why he's on the show again this week. Very happy to have him back. So thanks so much, David, for, for coming back onto the program. Well, thanks for having me. It's always an honor. It's always an honor, Carol. Thanks. Well, well, listen, I, I want to just sort of lead into the conversation a little bit with a couple of uh, of points and then get, get you to comment on them, if uh, that's all right. So a couple of things, you know, just to bring us up to speed, obviously we know that for the past seven months, uh, the left in Israel has been waging an insurrection against the government because they don't like the outcome of the elections. And this time they're saying it's about judicial reform, but really everything that they're doing, they planned uh, months, if not years in advance. Uh, this is something that I'll probably also be talking about in my in my news analysis this week. Um, but uh, one of the one of the most amazing things about what we're experiencing today is that a lot of the violence that we're seeing and the calls for the overthrow of the government are coming from former IDF generals. In fact, they're really leading the charge, and one of the main, they're using their rank to delegitimize the government, delegitimize Netanyahu uh, as former generals, uh, as former admirals, as former heads of the Bed, Mossad, etc. The IDF generals, the retired ones, are are playing a leading role in an effort to overthrow the government. Well, let, let me start with the behavior of the of the former generals. Um, there are two very disturbing things about it. The first is the most obvious, which is uh, generals are not necessarily uh, legal experts. Uh, and these are these are and and more moreover, the judicial reform isn't really a legal question. It is a political philosophy question. It is how do you organize your government? It's not a technical, legal, lawyerly question. That's a question about your basic philosophy of governance. I don't see a general as having any particular insight in that that is uh, transcends lawyers, let alone citizens who have to live under that system. So I think the leveraging, of the military credentials for an internal domestic political debate that involves deep political philosophical questions is um, highly problematic. They have no more expertise in this than you or I do. The second thing is all former chiefs of staff have come out against a reform. This tells me something not about the reform, but about the former chiefs of staff that they're operating in a conception or in conceptia in Israel, that they're so, that whenever you have 10 people in a row, uh, one is not going to agree with the rest if it's a legitimate political debate. And it is a legitimate political debate because half the country wants reform, half the country apparently does it. So if the chiefs of staff represent the Israeli people, there would be at least a few who would be for reform. There would be a few who represent the view of probably 80% of the Israelis that the military should be kept out of it, period. Maybe 90% of the Israelis believe that. And yet not one, not one has come out. Um, and, and that tells you something less about the reform and the issue on the table and more about the enclosed intellectual circle of the IDF chiefs of staff and the flag rank officers. It's, it's, it's a body that lives under a conception without outside intrusion. 
And that's very problematic. That is exactly the problem that went into the three war. It's very similar to the Supreme Court because in both cases, you have this hierarchy that has has managed, has maneuvered in a way that enables it, its members to be self-selecting. So the chief of staff is selected by 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 the chief of but is is ostensibly selected by the government, but uh, he the members of the general staff are selected by the chief of staff, so that you only are choosing from members of the general staff to get the chief of staff. That she, and and so. They choose each other, and then the government has a very limited pool of people that it can choose from to be the chief of staff, and it's always from the same pool of people that the chief of staff selects and promotes. And this is, you know, beginning in colonel going up to uh, um, a regular brigade uh, commander, like if you're a reserve brigade commander, if you want to be uh, uh, the commander of a regular brigade, which is promotion, you know, then all of these decisions are made by the chief of staff, um, and then... And then, you know, from there to division commander, reserve division, uh, regular division, all of the commands, uh, central command, northern command, southern command, et cetera, those are all made by the chief of staff. And then from that pool of senior officers, the government uh, has the power to choose the chief of staff. And even that uh, was questioned in the past defense minister, uh, uh, current defense minister, Yoav Gallant, was supposed to be. He was named chief of staff by a previous uh, um, Netanyahu government, and um, and then uh, uh, a radical it, and also fly by night uh, left wing straw organization petitioned the court against Gallant, and the Supreme Court overturned his appointment, um, and so he is now defense minister. He was deputy chief of staff. He was never permitted to be chief of staff because the left working with it generals inside of the IDF that didn't want him colluding with the Supreme Court justices and the then Attorney General Uta Weinstein uh, blocked him from serving as, as Chief of General Staff. So even when the government chooses among the generals, if it's a deviant general, which uh, Yoav Gallen was presumed to be or, or viewed as perceived to be, um, then they're also blocked by the same oligarchy that runs the court. So there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, uh, connections, I would say. Um, There's uh, connections. Incestuous connections, even, uh, between the you court and, the, and the general staff of the army. And you also get to some of the societal complexes that are involved with this reform. For example, if you talk to those who would defend this system, they would say, well, and, and Guy Peleg on Channel 12 News is a good example and so forth. Their attitude is in the legal system, well, look, I mean, if the right people on the right you know, Sephardi Jews, uh, people who are Likud, if they want to be primitive and they want to just worship, uh, you know, God and stuff like that, rather than go to medical school or to legal, uh, to uh, law school, then of course there's not going to be very many lawyers that these people can choose from. So it, even if they wanted to expand it and diversify the ranks, it isn't going to happen because it's a self-selective process by these primitive people. It's a, a snobbery. The truth is, and this is very important to understand, if you look at both the idea and the legal profession, if you go below the top level, there is huge diversity. The law schools are not empty of Sephardi Jews or religious Jews. In fact, there are a ton of Sephardi and religious Jews in the law schools and lawyers that graduate in the IDF, in combat including division. Including Haredi, by the way, including ultra-Orthodox. Including ultra-Orthodox Sephardic Jews. <laughs> but they... Correct. Yeah, I mean, the minority of the minority. And then, in, um, and then in the IDF, it's the same thing. If you go under flag rank and you go to the level of, um, uh, uh, you know, unit commanders, uh, platoon commanders, et cetera, on up. And up to battalion commander. Up to battalion commanders, not only is there a fair representation for Sephardi and religious and peripher and people from the periphery, uh, they actually make up the vast, vast majority of officers. So it has to be a very deliberate filtering out that's going on. It's not that they're not even democratic in their representation of society or unaligned with society. They are so distorted, it has to be an intentional effort. And now, I'm not that big on quotas and diversity 
but and 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 uh, you know I I it's part of it is yeah I wish Sephardi and Perifa had more opportunities in the IDF and had more opportunities uh, in the uh, legal profession than they do. But I think more importantly is the quality of decisions when you have an enclosed intellectual circle. It's out of whack with Israeli society. If you had an election of the top fifty officers in the IDF, my bet is. Merits, the far left party, would probably get 10, 15 seats. Whereas in and the they didn't Israeli even get into the Knesset because they're, they're, they they're, they're, they're the support. Knesset. Yeah. And they, so they, if you take all the uh, threshold it's, of, four, of four seats, it's completely warped. So what, what happens is half of society is losing trust in the other half of the institutions that, that define society. So the left will say, we built the country, we're the true Zionists, we believe in the institutions of this country, but the institutions of the country don't believe in half the country. And, the other ha and that half of the country is losing faith that those institutions truly are a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. So as a result, seeing the gap divide. So let's talk now just for about about the subject for which we we, we convened this this morning, um, which is the issue of American aid. Um, so we understand. I mean, there are a lot of levels of what's happening in Israel today. Per, you know that I started with today, but um, and one of them, one very very significant one, is ideological left versus right. Another one, very, very significant and, and increasingly significant, is the sociological divides inside of Israel. Uh, the first Israel, the Ashkenazic uh, secular elite, uh, are exposing themselves as truly hateful and racist in a lot of cases against those who don't look like them, don't believe like them, um, and uh, and don't don't occupy the same positions of privilege in Israeli society as they do. And then there's this third level, which is this kind of concept of uh, a globalist attitude about how the world should be organized versus a nationalist, a Zionist attitude about how the world should be organized. And here, I think, in this third level of, of understanding what's happening on the ground in Israel today, the U.S. military relationship or to aid with Israel, apparently with the Israeli military, um, is is uh, is a key component of what we're seeing. So I want to talk a little, or mostly now, about this issue of U.S. military aid. So first, can you give us a little bit of background about how U.S. military aid became such a dominant um, notion? And I'll just one last layer of this, which is that in the symposium that Tablet Magazine ran. There was an article by Amos Yadlin, who's sort of the, I don't know, in a sense, at least, you know, of the, of the, of the you know, retired leftist uh, generals in Israel. And he, he gave essentially two reasons why there mustn't be any reexamination, or really just one uh, major claim, why there shouldn't be any reexamination of this military aid and its opinion no matter what. And that is that. He says that, or he presented it as a demonstration, a tangible demonstration of U.S. support for Israel, and sort of the the apotheosis of U.S. support for Israel, if you will, the, the be all and end all, and that if it goes away, then it's going to, you know, be devastating because because uh, without it, America doesn't support Israel. America supports Israel through aid. Well. Um... It's, it, that's a very problematic argument because I think that uh, the aid right now is is probably as high, especially if you include the military interactions. Uh, CENTCOM is very close to, to Israel. If you take that, by all measures, this must be the most pro-Israeli administration that's ever existed. When in point of fact, this administration is one of the most hostile uh, that has ever faced Israel, uh, especially if you take it, if if you remove the, the the president, you look at the staff under him. These are people who are marginally, I would say, over the march. They're not they're not Zionists anymore. They don't believe in Israel's 
right to exist. When you look at Maher Bittar, who's the senior director for intelligence at the NSC, you look at Eddie Amar, you look at um, Bob Malley, who now is out, but, but was before. These are people who have a seething hatred of Israel. Uh, and, and so just because aid is at a certain level doesn't signal anybody anything about American support. Arguably, uh, uh, the greatest uh, American support for Israel was uh, was uh, strategic. Uh, votes in the UN to cover vetoes in the Security Council, uh, things that matter greatly. With uh, for example, take Eugene Rostow in 1967, the careful crafting of Resolution 242 to be consistent with the Rhodes Agreement and the League of Nations mandate so that it has so that Israel's legal foundations continue to exist number 1 which is by the way the League of Nations mandate not the UN General Assembly resolution of 1947 it's the League of Nations mandate and he carefully crafted the U UN resolution 242 in order to be uh consistent with that including the fact that the including including the fact that the uh, uh, territories that were captured were not called occupied and were basically left as indeterminate sovereignty that was the most pro-israeli action that almost any administration has done and this was a period where there was really basically no aid to israel so i would argue it's the strategic legal lawfare international structure uh, places that are the most important measures for pro-American behavior toward Israel. Are they shoring up the legitimacy of Israel, the legitimacy of Israel's point of view, and the legitimacy of Israel's uh, current situation uh, acting properly? So those, to me, are the measures. Unfortunately, APAC also has fallen into this because money is a good measure. It's easy to measure. How much did this administration give as opposed Obama gave a lot. And, and, it, and it, in fact, and he kept saying, I'm the most pro-Israeli administration because they gave a lot of money. doesn't matter that in the UN, he declared the Western Wall Palestinian territory under a UN Security Council resolution at the end. He's still the most pro-Israeli because he gave so much aid. The second thing about giving the aid is it's not in the spirit that it sounds. It's not the origins of the aid really tell you something about it. It isn't that, oh, we love Israel, let's just give them money. And the Israelis say, we're so desperate, we need the money. What happened was in 1970, the ceasefire of the War of Attrition, there was a war between the 67 War and the 73 War called the War of Attrition. It lasted three years and it emanated from the Egyptians and Syrians and others of the three no's of Khartoum, that they will not enter peace, they will not recognize Israel, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> the bottom line was their answer was also done in weapons and war. So they waged a war of attrition against Israel, and Israel began to use that war of attrition to improve its strategic position. It did the same thing as 67. Essentially, if force is forced on it, then at least use it to improve your strategic position. So the Israelis... Uh, heavily bombarded the first 40 kilometers of the Egyptian side with artillery, with commando attacks, air force attacks, etc. And the Egyptians had to push their forces back 40 kilometers. The result of that was that Israel had a visible, tangible, concrete 72 hours early warning because physically the Egyptian army was 72 hours movement from the canal. So when the ceasefire was signed, uh, in 1970, uh, after the Israelis did a particularly dangerous and, but, and successful set of operations against not only the Egyptians, but the, but the Russians themselves, uh, downing a lot of Russian aircraft piloted by Russians and killing the most senior Russian officer uh, that was in Egypt, uh, they, the Egyptians sued for a ceasefire. And of course, the moment the ceasefire was signed, the uh, Egyptian army started moving forward, which compromised Israel's ability to have 72 hours warning. Israel needs that 72 hours because it is a reserve army. It does not have enough forces to fight a war 
without calling up reserves. So it needs early warning, uh, a strategic buffer. L the intelligence community said, well, we can provide that 72 hours from human intelligence inside, si inside Syria and uh, Egypt, not from the physical intelligence that we're seeing on the border with the deployment of the Egyptian army. That's the intelligence mistake, not the conception of 1973, by the way. It was a strategic failure, which, which I'm getting into. So what happened was the Israelis wanted to resume the war of attrition to push the Egyptian army back. But the Americans came and they said, listen, we have this peace process, the Rogers plan. So please stop. Don't do anything. And the Israelis said, sorry, but no, we have to do something. This is very dangerous. We need, we need, that, we need that buffer. And uh, in the end, what the Americans said, you know what? That buffer can be delivered by technology. And that technology are fighter aircraft that cannot be shot down from the sky, tanks, etc. The Israelis said, well, that's beautiful, but we really don't have money for this. So the Americans said, why? We'll give you the money. You buy our equipment, we'll give you the money. That's where this, quote, qualitative mil military edge came. The first use of that was a few years later but of the word, but the actual essence of what that was was born in August 1970. And the whole point of it was not we love you, Israel. It's Israel, don't act strategically. Don't maintain your strategic maneuver and initiative. Go to a second strike absorbing strategy where you passively sit there and you react to an attack and sit on your hands and don't preemptively strike and don't shape the environment through constant use of force. So it was an act for, it was, a, it was, it was literally weapons and money for Israeli restraint so that we could pursue our peace process. And also because we had issues with the Russians. I mean, there were some other solid strategic issues. Well, this became the foundation of Israeli security policy. In 73, rather than they blamed the intelligence, which is fine, but the truth was the intelligence was asked to deliver something that is an improper of an intelligence organization to be requ required, which was uh, that 72 hours warning. The real failure was the strategic failure of not having a buffer between Israel's military and the Egyptian military that would allow for Israeli reservists to be mobilized. And then when the Israelis did see stuff, they were going to preemptively strike anyway, but they were told, no, restrain yourself. So you see how the American aid kicked in to cause Israel to restrain itself. And boom, all of a sudden, the Israelis wound up starting the war without reservists on the line and without the Air Force having preemptively struck. And then on top of it all, the Air Force was shot down and grounded. The great qualitative military edge, the planes that cannot be shot down, were shot down in droves, and the Air Force played no role in Israel's victory. So that then required an American resupply, which only deepened the concept of dependence on America rather than fundamentally question the utility of that or the wisdom of that. Ezra Weizmann, a man who shaped Israel's military and is more responsible for than anybody for Israel's greatest victory, the 67 war, was in the unity government in 1970 when it signed the ceasefire with Egypt. And he resigned. And he resigned because of this. Because he said, if the IDF begins to reshape its strategy and its behavior in order to get this weapon system or that weapon system, then it will no longer survive. It, if it were in 1948, Israel would not have been created. And then he resigned. He wrote it as his book on Eagle's Wings for anybody who wants to look it up. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, so so let's just to underline what you said, because I think this is actually the fundamental point. And and it informs the debate today just as strongly as it did 53 years ago, which is that the purpose of U.S. military aid from an American perspective is to prevent Israeli strategic moves. It's it's even to prevent Israeli strategic thinking, because because if you if you believe as Amos Yadlin and the generals who are now leading the insurrection and they're all mouthing the same talking points, 
that the United States is the guarantor of Israel's existence, and Israel cannot anger the United States because if it does, you know, by by defying its dictates, whether it's in relation to the maritime borders uh, with Lebanon, which is controlled by Iran through Hezbollah, or 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 with the Palestinians, where the United States wants Israel to just surrender uh, lands that we need in order to defend ourselves to exist, even in Tel Aviv, even in the the ghetto of of, of metropolitan Tel Aviv. Um, that that the United States is saying to the United States with this aid, uh, is saying to Israel with this aid, it's saying no strategic thinking, no strategic planning. Uh, uh, you cannot seek um, to deter your enemies by pushing them back. You know, you can't have any physical barrier between Israel and the enemy forces perched literally at its border or in the case of the Hezbollah tent, inside of its sovereign territory you cannot have any buffer between yourselves you can't you know push them back uh, north of the latani in 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 lebanon you can't uh, dissolve the palestinian authority which is a terrorist organization you can't do any of these things um because we guarantee your security and we guarantee your security as yadlin claims through this aid and we need this aid which only makes up a six or less than a six of the IDF's budget, you know. Um, we need this aid in order to survive. So that this 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 entire package is actually it it, it it's its goal is to reach this kind of of welfare complex where we have leaders in the IDF that are uh, refusing to think strategically about the battlefield. Yeah, what what happened was that originally the dependence on the United States had some strategic utility for Israel also because, yeah, let's face it, there was a Cold War. The Soviet Union was a very nasty enemy. Uh, the Israelis were being attacked as the front line of the West, the vulnerable front line of the West by the and Soviet. And we were being attacked. It's important to note we were being attacked by Soviets. We weren't just being attacked by Egyptians. We were being attacked by Soviet pilots. Absolutely. Who were absolutely. Absolutely, this there was Soviet aircraft flying over the Suez Canal in 1970. By Soviets, by, right. by Russians, absolutely. Most... I mean, there's uh, there's monuments to Russians killed in the air defense system in Egypt. So it, Israel was the front line, and also it was the test bed for Soviet weaponry. So so both Israel and the United States benefited at that point from from the extreme danger that was frankly a little big on Israel to handle on its own the Soviet threat. Israel was the front line, if not one of the most important front lines in the Cold War. And I would argue, by the way, a very important point, that nobody recognizes the 1980 war as an episode in the context of the Cold War. And in my view... The 1970 it was, war. The, no, the 1982 war. The Lebanon war. Oh, the 1982 war in, in Lebanon. Okay. So you're yeah, just, and the, the reason why I say this is that the Soviet Union in 1982, before 1982... Because of the 73 war, the perception in the West was that the West was losing the conventional battle against Russia and could no longer conventionally defend itself in Europe because the mix of weaponry in Europe was roughly similar to the mix of weaponry Israel had that didn't succeed so well in 73. So there was a perception that the Russians were pouring huge amounts into the air defense system in Europe. But they were also pouring all this into the air defense system in Syria and in the Bekaa Valley in Lebanon. And it became an icon of Western strategic thinking that air power was shut down more or less and heavily compromised. And as a result, ground forces are vulnerable and Russia's ground forces are superior to American ground forces, which is a different debate. But whatever, let's assume that that was, a, that that's, that was the perception at the time. So when Israel went in in 1982, it completely obliterated the myth of Russian air defense superiority and fundamentally changed the momentum, the strategic momentum on the European continent. Because all of a sudden, Western planners began to realize that with these technologies that Israel just employed, our conventional position in Europe is not bad at all. In fact, we have a superiority over the Russians still. And all of a sudden, the idea that America was losing the Cold War became America could win the Cold War. And this was the Reagan era, so they picked up on that. 
and they they ran with it. And it was that that was, in my view, a tremendous victory for the West that ultimately led to the collapse of the Soviet Union and a sense of resignation that the West militarily cannot be defeated that gripped Moscow and then caused the ideological crisis that led to the Soviets' collapse. So again, Israel acting on its own was very important. But going back to the Israeli- Wait, uh, actually, to- I just want to underline here as well. I think, you know, we saw in 1973 when Israel was on the event, when despite the air forces collapse at the outset of the war, the ground forces in a in a very brilliant maneuver move, were able to encircle the Egyptian Third Army. And in flies Henry Kissinger and says, no, you're not allowed to obliterate the Egyptian military. You're supposed to leave it as a dirt deterrent force essentially against you. And then in, in 82, we saw a repetition of this with the Reagan administration, right? That that they insisted that Israel permit Yasser Arafat and the PLO to leave Lebanon and live to fight another day. So that there there was this and there was an extraordinary demonization of Israel uh, that that the you know find the media, the BBC, Vanessa Redgrave, Tom Friedman, and all of the you know all the cast of characters that were nor- that that were used to. He was Anthony Lewis at the New York Times also. But you, you had the Reagan administration participating in that as well. When when Reagan was commenting on a on a canned image of a little girl in Lebanon and blaming Israel, and and so you had you had profound acts of hostility by the Reagan administration against the Israeli war in Lebanon, and then you had. And I'll just add this because I it drives me crazy every time the Marines came in in order to block an Israeli victory in Lebanon. They were sort of and and then they found themselves, and that was the amazing thing, the horrible thing about the Marine barracks uh and the US Embassy bombing by Hezbollah or proto Hezbollah in eighty two, which was that they found themselves being treated by the Lebanese as though they were stand-ins for Israel, because from the Lebanese perspective and from the Syrian perspective, they were. So here was the United States behaving just with massive hostility towards Israel uh, and that we were the problem. They came in, replaced us as peacekeeping forces in, in Beirut, and they got smashed because the Lebanese themselves and the Syrians viewed them as Israeli. So the, the, And they refused to accept this, they blocked Israel's victory in 82, just as they blocked Israel's victory in 73, when Israel's victories were profound victories for the United States. They were, because if you perceive Israel as the front line of the West against the Soviet Union, an Israeli victory is a trem- and by the way, this will get to the current, it's a tremendous a force multiplier for the West. And, and that was in 1982 with the PLO, and that was in 1973 with the Egyptians. It was also in 67, by the way, when we were not doing so well in Vietnam. Um, nowadays, this is an even more important thing, which is the United States is withdrawing from the region, does not have the will to fight in the Middle East to defend its interests, which means it needs to find allies who will carry the water. And, and Israel has always been the ally that's there. Its victories, its power, its strength reflects on the West as a whole. So now more than ever, it's important that Israel has strength and shows itself to be strong. But you raise the issue of deterrence, which is exactly how this now evolves after 73. Restraint eventually means that the Israelis have to sit there and accept the second strike. Well, ultimately, that devolves into the same thing America devolved into, which is this raising of deterrence to the level of strategy. Deterrence is not a strategy. It, it doesn't, a strategy is, is how do you get from point A to point B, and what is the map that you have? How do you understand the enemy? How do you understand your strengths, your own weaknesses, your vulnerabilities, etc.? Deterrence has nothing to do with that. Deterrence is a tactic. Raised on a very high level, it's still a tactic and doesn't particularly work that well sometimes. So essentially, Israel moved to a position of deterrence. Uh, And that meant that strategically underneath the PLO, the Russians, et cetera, all of Israel's enemies, 
continued with strategic behaviors, strategic attacks. And at the end of the day, Israel watched as deterrence underneath, you started creating a strategic deter deterioration. Um, so deterrence itself has to be questioned. So you see the distortions that are beginning to kick in. As far as the money and the aid going toward helping Israel, I think Iron Dome is a great example. I'm all for Iron Dome. I'm all for defense, missile defense. Uh, I think it's wonderful, but it's like the air defense of a ship uh, in World War II, a, a battleship in the World War II. And there were arguments. Why put anti-aircraft? Because some aircraft will still get through. Well, you put it because it, it helps the ship survive. Uh, air defense has to be looked at that way in Israel. But the problem with Israel is, again, its Iron Dome has become a vehicle for strategic passivity. It has become a vehicle for not dealing with the situation in Gaza. And let's be real. Accepting the fact that every two years Israel has 6,000 missiles thrown on it. Okay, I, I pray to God nobody gets killed. I am so thankful that so few have. And I, 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 you know, I completely appreciate all those who work on and did develop the Iron Dome so Israelis don't get killed, even in war. But to replace Israeli strategic thinking and strategic action and strategic maneuver with a passive defense like that, with a, with a uh, strategic paralysis and a fiction of deterrence, is strategic malpractice. And that's exactly, uh, that's exactly the essence of the problem here now. So, you know, one of the things, I mean, that, that pro-Israel, extremely pro-Israel uh, people in the United States, like uh, Senator Ted Cruz, who's arguably the most important friend of, that Israel has in the Senate today, now, I would argue that um, he he uh, he 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 argues, you know, that among other things, that you know it would send absolutely the wrong message at the wrong time to Iran to even have a conversation. That the conversation about ending U.S. military assistance to Israel is undermining Israel's is, is Israel's strategic position because it it makes it seem as though the United States is abandoning. It. How how do you? How do you respond to that? I mean, there it's it's a legitimate concern, especially when you're looking at. I mean, like we said you you mentioned at the outset that you have these deeply hostile uh, administrations, Biden administration and, and the Obama administration first and foremost, that are, have expanded U.S. military assistance. It was the Obama administration that signed the current memorandum of understanding that provides Israel with 3.8 billion dollars. Uh, of coupons essentially to use with uh, U.S. Uh, defense industries to procure uh, weapon systems, which, by the way, the United States also dictates which weapon systems Israel can buy and which it can't buy. Israel had wanted F-15Is and F-16s, and the Americans uh, said, no go, you must purchase uh, with this money. You're not allowed to have anything but the F-35. So it's not even really that Israel gets to decide what it gets. The United States gives them to 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 Israel what it what it wants and it and it's worth three point eight billion dollars billion part, dollars a part year. of the aid was that Israel gave up a good bit of its fighter aircraft aeronautics industry in the eighties. This was something the defense minister at the time, Moshe Ahrens, was bitterly upset about uh, the giving up of, of Israel's indigenous fighter. And we don't know where Israel would be now and how dependent it would really be on the F thirty five if Israel had had a robust fighter program. It had a robust fighter program. It had already produced at that time one of the world's best fighter aircraft, the the um, Fear. The well, the Levy was the prototype, but it was actually deploying Fears, uh, which right. is still in service. But I, I, I mean, that. Let me just before we before we go off uh, in that direction, which is a great direction. But before we do, I mean, all I'm asking is, so what do you what do you say to somebody like Ted Cruz? Well, well who what is I say is. This argument? Well, I think that the, the issue is the administration's demeanor toward Israel. There's not one single country in the Middle East who does not see the United States right now as abandoning Israel and abandoning their allies and trying to appease the Iranians. Nobody has any illusions about that. This is absolutely clear to Riyadh, to Abu Dhabi. This is clear to Amman and to Cairo. 
This is clear to Marat. It's it's clear to everybody. So all the aid in the world doesn't convince anybody in the region that America is standing up to Iran. In contrast, under Trump, everybody knew that it, that that Israel had a had a much looser leash from the United States, and that scared the Iranians. And we had a, a tougher policy on Iran, and and we we choked them. So literally, uh, what really is the measure of American support for Israel against Iran is not the level of military aid, but the level of American tolerance of Israeli strategic behavior against Iran and Israeli uh, and, and, and American behavior against Iran. And both of those were lacking under Obama and both of those are lacking under the Biden administration. So no amount of aid compensates that. That's the real problem. You can cut back aid if the United States unleashes Israel and says, listen, but you know what? We're going to let you do what you, because military action, strategic initiative counts for a hell of a lot of aircraft and a lot of money. So when you re release Israel to act without restraint, there's a lot of things that can be solved that, that right now can only be somewhat partially addressed by piling on more aid and more weapons. That's that's one thing. By the way, I do want to return one more thing to the Aiden II war and the PLO. The, the strategic negative of it was allowing the PLO to survive, as you said. And I don't think Israelis or supporters of Israel fully appreciate the damage done. Because when the Soviet Union fell in 1989 uh, and 1990-1991, uh, you know, the empire fell in 89, the, the government fell in 91. Uh, the, uh, the PLO became the last refuge for global progressives who were pro-Soviet, the, the Che Guevara crowd. It became the last refuge to grip onto, to maintain a sense of progressive cause. It, otherwise, it was a catastrophic defeat of the left. And, and that was the only hopeful spot. So in many ways, the PLO became the Noah's Ark uh, for the progressives. And Oslo, with the Israelis essentially giving that Noah's Ark food, water, and eventually ground to land on. Uh, so Israel, in many ways, somewhat reversed the devastating blow that the progressives globally faced through the Oslo Agreement. I don't think this is fully appreciated by Israelis. Um, had the, de the, the lifeline that they threw, not the PLO, but global progressives uh, by, by saving the PLO. And that, because it was, it was the center of progressive global consciousness uh, at that time. So that's one thing about the Israeli aid and the military. I forgot where we were going, but um, with that. No, I mean, it, it, I think I think that the, the question then becomes what, because today there is there's a growing sense. I know I certainly I certainly uh, uh, subscribe to the view that um, the United States, the Pentagon um, in particular, but not only uh, the Democratic Party, um, are, are becoming intimately engaged in uh, IDF operations down to the you know platoon and company level. I mean, we see this through the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem, where you have you have interference, you have involvement with IDF operations in Judea and Samaria. By the U.S. Embassy, I think they have the military coordinator that was set up under Condoleezza Rice, who really set up a lot of the institutional basis for the chief pathologies of American operations in the Middle East since under Obama, who ex expanded it. But I mean, she was the one who set up the negotiations with Iran. She was the one who started massively uh, uh, massive military assistance to the Lebanese armed forces, even though they were proven to be an auxiliary force of Hezbollah in the 2006 war. And yet in response to that, she started arming them. And then she set up or expanded the operations of the American military coordinator in, in, uh, to the Palestinians. 
operating under the aegis of the American embassy in, in then in Tel Aviv and now in Jerusalem. And they're actually um, involved and and with the participation and the acceptance of the Israeli general staff, of the IDF general staff, at very granular level, granular levels of of tactical warfare on the part of Israel. So the IDF goes into Janine a few months, a few weeks ago, in, in, and uh, for like two days, and the Americans are immediately on it, and they're 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 watching absolutely every move that Israel makes inside of Janine, and you know, g- giving grades in real time to IDF operations. And then dictating when those operations are going to end. I mean, I think it only went on for 48 hours. And, you know, the end of American tolerance for this tiny little massively important counterterrorist operation where Israelis are getting massacred right, left and center. And the hub of those terror operations is Janine. And here's the United States, you know, with a stopwatch from the outset of the operation. And here, too, you see an extraordinary level of cooperation between the IDF general staff, chief of staff Herzia Levy, um, what's his name, the 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 uh, uh, the the uh, uh, central command commander who who came, who was previous who, who began his command two weeks after he finished his stint as the Israeli defense attaché in Washington, and you know, I mean, this is just I feel appalled by this, that you have a foreign power I- involved at such a tactical low level of decision making. And I don't even know where the government is in any of this, whether any of this uh, action is, is in any way coordinated with the defense minister, with with the government of Israel, or whether it's just direct U.S. Uh, actions with the Israeli military. But it but but it's pretty outrageous. Well, look, it goes back to a fundamental point. We're not, that that, that the aid now has become so pervasive and structuring and distorting Israeli strategic thinking that the IDF basically believes it cannot survive without it. So essentially the strategy now is we're not, we're, we're not, but it for the purse of America. 4,000 years of Jewish sovereign claims to the territory, to, to, to Eretz Israel, and Israel won't survive. So they really have convinced themselves that American aid now is a sine qua non of Israel's continued existence, which is really an upturning of Zionism, uh, which is that the Jews assert their right to sovereignty over their own survival and self defense, and that when necessary, what we learned from World War II is in the end, you have to rely on yourself. It's a very good American idea, too. That's why Americans loved Israel so much, because Israel always relied on itself. And now all of a sudden, you get this constant refrain that if not, but for the American purse, it ends. This really started, and and by the way, that then leads to if you're going to hold aid hostage to demand of Israel certain, and you use the Israeli perception of that, and you use that as essentially take hostage Israel's defense for political ends, the peace process, Janine, love of, of, of the PA, still thinking that it's some real entity that can survive and so forth. If, if the foreign powers do it, then it's an, it's, a, it's an intellectual slide immediately to those units in the Israeli military who are tied to the American aid most and are most reliant on the Americans they see this utility in holding Israel's defense hostage, and all of a sudden, Air Force pilots now say that. So it, it, it is the use of leverage over, the, over critically strategic elements, the aid and the Air Force, which are critically strategic because the aid has distorted Israel to some extent and distorted strategy, and so they do have that leverage because the the Israelis perceive that's the only way to go, and they have shaped their military around that. So it's a very dangerous. By the way, this started under Reagan. And just for one second, I just want for one second. I'm sorry. I know my 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 viewers can't stand it when I interrupt people, so I apologize to my viewers as yeah, well. But, but you know this stuff I, too, so but, that's fine. But just a, but just a key point that I think you're pointing to is, um, 
is is the is the Air Force. And you said earlier, rightly, a point that is just ignored all the time, which is that the Air Force played no role in the Israeli victory in seventy three. And it was all ground maneuver force that did it, the tank battle in the Sinai, et cetera. You, you, you know, the, uh, the Air Force in Israel, among Israelis, is viewed as the decisive strategic arm of the IDF. The maneuver force, if you listen to people like uh, uh, retired General Yitzhak Brick, who was the ombudsman uh, of the IDF for, for over a decade as, as, in, as a retired general, um, and he says that the maneuver force has been just completely abandoned and ignored. And, you know, our ground forces from our logistical trains to our, you know, to, to our ammunition stores, et cetera, it's not in a position to win a war because everything has gone to the Air Force. And yet the Air Force, you know, in in 2006 in Lebanon, they flunked, right? I mean, the Khalid, who was the chief of staff at the time, the first and I hope only former Air Force uh, uh, commander was leader the chief of, of staff the of the army. Leader of the protest movement, a failure. And ya- Amos Yadlin was the chief of intelligence at that time. Also a failure. 2006 was a failure on so many levels. And these are the leaders right now the of the protest movement. Right, and they're not, and and they and they're, his model for a decisive ba- a decisive conclusion of the war in two thousand and six was entirely based on air power, and it totally failed. And so here we have this conception, another like you said, a concepcia as we call it in Israel, that our strategic defense is predicated on air power. When we lost air superiority when the Russians came back to Syria in two thousand and. 15 and immediately put up uh, S 400 batteries for et cetera. But so talk a little bit about, you know, the perversion of Israel's strategic capabilities of our, our, our cognitive ability to understand strategic realities when you have a military that its entire strategic thinking, such as it is, is predicated on this myth of air power being the the decisive, most important arm of the Israeli military. You saw with the protest movement right now what the sort of mentality behind it was, which is the Air Force is, is the IDF. It is the basis for Israel's survival. It is the basis for Israeli war fighting capability. It is the basis for protecting the state. And um, therefore, you must give in to the Air Force. You mu- and the Air Force being an elite structure, obviously, is populated by people from a certain segment of society that represent the elites. And the elites are a self-perpetuating, we've dis- discussed this in terms of the judicial, and it's a self-perpetuating structure where parents bring their children, et cetera, et cetera. So it isn't representative of Israel. The reality, though, is that's not Correct. Seventy-eight percent of Israel com- Israel's combat casualties in the last decade or two have been from soldiers from the periphery. The very people that the protest movement is saying, "You live so nicely because we have to def- we carry the burden of the defense of the state of Israel on our so- shoulders through our pilots." In our cyber unit, which is a similar issue. And just a parenthetical remark here is that I think it was David Weinberg brought the data in a recent column, I think in the Jerusalem Post, where he showed that actually there's more um, secular youth uh, from privileged backgrounds that are not going into the IDF today than than ultra orthodox, that um, or, or something like that. That 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 the highest numbers of refusers of service are among uh, the secular, not among the the ultra orthodox. Which is, I mean, that this is a sea change, and yet after this sea change has already occurred, they're pretending, and of course the media is going along with this, and the American Jewish community is going along with this, that they are the backbone of the idea. They're yeah, the backbone I mean, of the general staff, but not of the idea. The whole myth of the old secular Ashkenazi 
socialist, not socialist anymore, kibbutz grandchildren who live on Sheinkin Avenue in Tel Aviv, which is the equivalent of the Upper East Side in New York in America. Or Chelsea. Uh, Chelsea, yeah. Chelsea. The, the, these are, this is really the ones who built the state, made the state successful, and now carry the burden of the state, and therefore Zionism is owned by them. And how dare these people who are now a majority in Israel, the Sephardi, Im Russian immigrants, uh, religious, traditional, Haredi, how dare these, even though they may represent 50, 60, 70% of the population, how dare they steal from us, the elites, the, the, the Zionism? It is ours. But, and, and yes, to, and, and, and by the way, that then informs where the aid goes from America. And then the Americans have that power over the elites because their preferred structure of the IDF, the thing that allows them to maintain the myth, the Air Force is the be-all and end-all of the IDF, the Air Force needs F-35s, F-35s need American aid, blah, blah, blah. All this is sort of an enclosed circle now that maintains well, it. I want to ask. I want to ask two questions uh, now that we're, we're going to wind down. The first one is a question about military futures. And the second one is about specifically what Israel should be doing now if you were advising Prime Minister Netanyahu. So the first aspect of it is, you know, I said, uh, and Air Force pilots hate to hear this and they won't listen, but you look at what's happening in Ukraine. And you look at the fact that, you know, the F-35, they started uh, building it or, or planning it in the 1990s. It took forever for them to feel that it's had just no end of problems since it was fielded because the, the, the technology was already antiquated by the time that it was fielded. And you look and you see that in Ukraine and in Israel as well, you know, our enemy's air forces are all unmanned. I mean, Hezbollah has an air force. It's it's drones, and so does Hamas, and they have missile forces that are massive and decisive, and our Air Force has no response that's that's useful to the missiles. We have we have Iron Dome that's useful, but we don't have a combat response to that to neutralize it. So, you know, we're looking at, uh, at a 20th century uh, military concept when in the 21st century, it looks like we're moving towards unmanned flights, we're moving through drones, we're looking at uh, uh, missile wars, and yet Israel, I think largely due to this American aid complex, we're not building the missile corps, we're not developing in a very serious and aggressive way our drone capabilities. Um, and these are things that looking to the next five to ten years are becoming more and more important and certainly going forward. So when you and by the way, the Americans, I don't think they are not building their fifth generation or their sixth generation F-55 fighter or whatever. You know, there's no, there's, they should have started building it five years ago just on that timeline. They haven't. So you're, you're, you know, you're wondering, like, where is this, if, if Israel were thinking strategically, would they even be thinking about the Air Force? And then the final question is, what, what do you, what would you tell Prime Minister Netanyahu when he's looking at this? Uh, a rebellion of the elites led by these former generals, with the with the focal point of it all being the being the air force. Well, my sense is the the thing that Prime Minister Netanyahu would have to look at is: Do you have sufficient equipment? Given what's going on, do you have a sufficient force to do what you need to do on Iran? If you do. Uh, then, then, um, then disregard this and punish those who are, because the IDF has to remain out of politics. And I don't see how this happens. If there's any concession given to those who've ha taken Israel's defense hostage, uh, for a political objective, uh, tomorrow it'll be a settler from, uh, from, uh, Gaza, you know, one of the displaced ones from Gaza will turn around and say, well, we were idiots. We didn't resist. Uh, so let's go back. We need to go back to Nevedekalim and so forth. We need to go back to the Gaza Strip settlements because we were we were just dupes. We didn't realize that we should have taken the IDF hostage. We showed up. We served. We didn't question the IDF. Uh, 
So, and, and anything else that happens, you know, tomorrow Israel wants to, some leftist government wants to dismantle a settlement and so forth. There's no end to political blackmail of the IDF if, if it becomes normalized, and it is about to become normalized. So I think there's no response to Israeli government. In fact, that's one of the reasons why I think uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu had to pass this last element of reform. Whether it's right or wrong is a different question. The moment that it became a blackmail by those officers and said, if the, it passes the second and third, we will refuse to serve. At that point, the government had no choice but to call their bluff. And maybe it's not even a bluff, but bottom line is they had to call it to show, no, we will not politicize the, allow the IDF to be politicized. Even if I didn't agree with the reform, that specific piece of the reform, I would have to do it simply to make the point the IDF cannot be held hostage. So this is good. So I think he needs to look at what's in his hands. Is there what needs to be done for Iran? If so, fine, proceed. If there's not, then question yourself why everything was based for, uh, why has everything been based on such a narrow foundation that a few people whose political, you know, the United States and a few, uh, officers can hold Israel hostage to that. So that becomes a more difficult question. As far as Hezbollah in Lebanon goes, look, it obviously having a strong air force and having everybody show up is better than having a weak air force and having a bunch of people not show up. But it is part of a mix of weaponry. It's basically saying, I produce a gun, so everybody depends on me. That soldier, he's not the one who owns Zionism because he just uses it or he's benefiting from the gun. The gun just sits there if there's not a soldier to use it. Everybody depends on everybody in Israel, and it's a ripping apart of the social fabric of Jewish community. 4,000 years, really, ever since Mount Sinai, when we overcame tribes and, and became one people through law, we had a unified Klal Yisrael, uh, that, that, that we were a community. This is a violation of the social fabric that we have held for three and a half thousand years. We stand for each other. We all depend on each other. We're all a family. And this is what has been ripped here by the opposition by using the military, because the military is the symbol of our communal survival at this point. So you're ripping at the symbol of our communal survival by entangling it in domestic political issues. I couldn't agree more. And, 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 you know, I'm all for tribalism. Don't get me wrong. I think that uh, it, it's, uh, it's a beautiful tapestry of tribes. And I don't have any problem with people maintaining their tribal identity. I think it's a fantastic way to maintain social peace. The problem is, is, not, is not that people are different. It's that uh, one tribe uh, doesn't respect any of the other ones. And, and, and that's really what, we, you know, we, we've gotten along as a people in Israel for the past 80 years or so because, um, to a large degree, the disrespect that our elites have always shown for the rest of the tribes has not been this dangerous. It's always been within, you know, under wraps or within certain bounds. And now, because they've never been respectful, of the rest of the tribes in Israel, but now their disrespect for the rest of the tribes of Israel uh, has 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 become so outrageous and so extreme that they're saying that they're willing to destroy the country uh, if they don't get to lord over everybody completely, one hundred percent, even as they fade and the other and the other tribes become more powerful. I mean, I think that's really what we're seeing here. Such disrespect for Ben-Gurion, who still believed strongly in Jewish history and Jewish peoplehood and, uh, and uh, uh, had deep respect for Jewish tradition and Jewish religion. Uh, and for, for everybody else, you see anti-Semitic motifs, throwing money at Jews they don't like, calling Jews, uh, religious Jews, bloodsuckers. Etc. This has now become the norm on the left, unfortunately. Which are these are anti-Semitic mythologies. So um, again, this is very dangerous. I'm for tribes on one level. What I, what it, it gets to the legal issue, but by and large, 
Israel's problem right now is you have an elite that sees the legal foundations of law based on values that are based on community. So you don't have an inherent right to rights, which is what, what it, the Judeo-Christian um, uh, foundations are. It started at Mount, uh, Mount Moriah with the Akidat Yitzchak, with the near sacrifice of Isaac, and the fundamental message that the human life of this child belongs to God, not even to the parents. The parents can't decide, I don't want this child, I'll kill him. Or he can't decide, you know, if God wants him to die. In other words, the life itself is a creation and belongs to God, not even to the parents, certainly not. The, that's the foundation for individual rights. And individual rights then drive legal rights, which drive essentially a properly functioning society. That's why religious Jews and Amish live perfectly happily in America, in the same country that a guy who's homosexual in San Francisco does, because they are guaranteed their individual rights. We don't have rights based on communal values. The European system from the French Revolution is there's a community, it has a social will, it has this mystical social contract, that social contract embodies certain values. You live within those values, and therefore all your legal rights are defined as in the, in, the, in the framework of those values, not your individual rights, those values. The problem is a secular Jew in Scheinkin Street in Tel Aviv, Israel's Chelsea, does not have the same values as a religious Jew sitting in Bnei Brak, a Haredi Jew, doesn't it? They have different values. So the only way to solve that is to have a legal system that isn't governmentally activist, legally activist, uh, social engineering activist, that operates on this basis of imposing the communal values of one group on the other group. Because that if you have an activist government, one group has to impose it on the other, the other has to give in. So that becomes a battle, a battle of power over which community rules the state because the state defines the values and defines your rights. If we go back just to just to go back to the to the specific issue that we're talking about here, which is American military aid. I mean, I, I think that I think that the the basic concept that's emanating from our discussion is that uh, the aid from an American perspective is to is to rein in Israel. It's to block Israel from having a strategic uh, thinking at the top levels of the IDF. And the IDF, over time, over the intervening 50 years, and really from the outset, has embraced this concept of restraint in order to maintain those ties with the United States uh, and, and then block anyone who questions this concept of non-strategic thinking, of non-strategic operation, but that, that Israel is no longer a strategic actor because we're restrained by this qualitative military edge, which itself has been proven repeatedly to be a myth. But we're restrained by this concept so that you can't get promoted if you don't share it. So that, that, that the aid itself has blocked any diversification of, mind, of mindsets, of points of views, inside of the Israeli military top echelons. And then and then that becomes both self-perpetuating and also enables the United States to use its aid as a means to intervene, not only at the tactical level, as we saw in Janine just a few weeks ago, but also at the political level inside of Israel, so that they use the people from the IDF general staff who agree with strategic restraint, who have embraced this concept. And then they work together in saying that people who don't appreciate this concept, who don't share this concept, who want a different concept, who want sovereignty back, who want Zionism back as the overarching strategic concept for Israel from asserting power when they are elected to power or from being raised to positions of decision making inside of the IDF general staff. I think that 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 sort of, if we wanted to summarize the pathological impact that U.S. Uh, military aid, which is misnamed, but whatever, mil uh, 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 towards Israel has 
has caused to Israeli, uh, to the Israeli military general staff, and to and to Israeli politics uh, in general. I think if we wanted to summarize, yeah, and I'd add one more dimension to it, which is the future, in the sense that we see the future right now with Ukraine and uh, the global. Israel has this morning signed with Elbit Systems uh, 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 to produce tens of thousands of 155 millimeter shells uh, that that uh, uh, it needs in the next year or two. The production will begin in 2024, so still a minimum half a year away. Why? Because the world has run out. The Western armies have run out of 155 millimeter shells. They've been burned up in Ukraine, and, and the rate of burning them is so high right now that no industrial current industrial production uh, in the West can keep up with it. We take a month to produce a week's worth of shell use. So the world has run out of 155 millimeter shells, not the world, the Western world, has run out of 155 millimeter shells. Israel's strategic buffer stockpile that the United States had in the Negev is empty now of those shells. And Israel, if faces a war, was depending on resupply from that. And it won't get it. So the very dependence on the West, because the West doesn't want to mobilize for war. It's in a war, doesn't want to mobilize. So it's still basically still in peacetime mode production. Well, Israel's going to face the, the price of that. And that's something Israel has to think very seriously about. If there's another war, some of its planes get shot down or inoperable. Is America really going to sell them the next batch? Of, of, of F-35s, is they're really going to sell them the next batch of, of 155 millimeter uh, shells? I, America is stretched out, and Israel has to begin to pick up the, realize the consequences of that and pick up the ball. Israel has to align with countries around the world, whether it's India or, or Japan or South Korea or so forth, to create almost an ersatz alliance that currently the United States and in the past the United States provided. That doubles the need for Israel to be independent, even if you want it to remain dependent on the United States. That is a dangerous way to go right now, simply from the standpoint of military capability. I, I Just one thing, and then we'll end. I, I missed, uh, there was a uh, buzzer going off in, in the house. And uh, I didn't hear what you said. Elbit is starting to, is going to start producing 155? In 2024, they will start the production of te tens of thousands of shells. For the IDF. For the IDF. All right. But that's well, 2024. That's a half a year away. And tens of thousands is what? How many do the Ukrainians use in a day? How many do they use in a week? That's not enough for a war. Not, not right. until... Well, and and again, we had to close down our domestic production because we agreed to buy it all in the including iron missiles, which is... And and again, we have AOC and, and Bernie Sanders, and their number keeps increasing, saying they want to hold Iron Dome missiles hostage to Israel's policy. Yeah, and the Rand Pauls. And by the way, it violates American... Americans love it when people are independent. If you're willing to fight for yourself, Americans feel it's worthy to fight with you. But when you say, please save us, please help us, please give us money, please give it, the Americans are like, well, look, I mean, if you're not willing to sacrifice for your own survival and you say it's absolute, but then you act like, well, you know, we'll do it if we don't pay a price. You act like South Vietnam. You actually undermine American support. The more Israel's independent, the more it has American support. That's the inverted relationship, the inverted the inverse relationship. But again, I'm not sure Israelis and many American supporters of Israel properly appreciate this. Americans love people who stand on principle and fight for it, not beg to have others save them. And of course, the majority of Israelis are those people, and they're being quashed by the Israeli uh, elites led by these retired generals who insist that we can't, we can't survive without America. So in a way, you know, they're they're the most they're the most devastating strategic actor in Israeli society today. I think we're going to have to leave it at that because otherwise people are going to. Uh, it's strategy uh, you know. by government mentality. But uh, we'll but we'll but we'll uh, obviously pick this up soon. And and there are other issues that emanated from it, like the United States dangling this peace thing for further dependence on the Biden administration from Jerusalem. 
the peace with Saudi Arabia and other things. But we'll get to that another time. Uh, in the meantime, guys, uh, I have more of my thoughts on my on my analysis this week, and uh, and um, I want to thank David for coming back to the show and having this very important discussion. And uh, have you subscribed yet? If you haven't subscribed, subscribe already. And uh, and I'll see you again next week with another. Actually, next week we're going to be off. Uh, we'll be back in two weeks. So see you soon. Thanks, David. Take care. Thank you.